there's a lot of uh, very um, sort of m moody, poignant uh, montages and, and images where you, you, you rest on the characters, you rest on the mood, um, as well as um, a lot of the action sequences. It, how many cameras were you actually filming with? Did you both have a camera there? Because it, sometimes like in the, within the edit as well, it feels like almost like as, as a multi-camera Hollywood film, but I suppose you living so close with not only the soldiers, but also your cinematographer, Lars, mm -hmm. did you begin to develop this, um, this instinct for knowing where you want each other to be and what you should be filming to capture, best capture what you wanted to capture? Um, well, I mean, we did use multiple cameras uh, on patrols to be able to cover as much as possible. And we used helm cameras also because when you're filming in a war, it's very chaotic and, and most often you're, uh, you're distanced from the, when things happen. I mean, um, and what cameras? Fortunately so, sometimes if a bomb goes off. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's all filmed with small cameras, trying to you know, create a sense of being in the boots of the soldiers, being very reportage style filming, cross-cutting also with helm cameras that have this kind of first person uh, you know, POV experience, also mimicking the aesthetics of computer gaming. Um, and then, uh, I mean... Well, one shot which uh, I thought was, was very unusual for this type of film, but which um, was relatively short, but which I really felt got allowed me to, to really get into the mind of, of the soldier, his thoughts, while on patrol was... Um, a shot, I believe it was, of, of Mass, where his, you've got a camera in front of him, it's, it's strapped onto him, and you, whilst he's walking, you see mm. him looking, and it's just really close up. Yeah. Um, but what were the actual technical uh, details uh, of the yeah. cameras that you used? No, we, we did some very stylized things as well to talk about, you know, how do we represent the feeling of alienation and the feeling of surveillance and the feeling of paranoia? And, uh, you know, one of the things we did to try and get that was that we made some shots of soldiers where they were, you know, mounted with a, a, a body uh, mounted camera that, that were on these magic arms, you call them, filming straight into his face. So the camera stays in one position, but the background is moving. So you're observing him as everything else is moving. And normally, you know, he, he's moving in the frame. So here you got him steady in the frame and everything else is moving. And that just, I don't know, created a weird sense of, you know, going into his head, feeling that, you know, shit, everything else around me is, is kind of, you know... In turmoil. Yeah, that kind of feeling. And... Um, um, you know, the, I mean, that's what I'm, I was talking about before, trying to, trying to use cinema to, to, get, to actually get us closer to a feeling of what's it like to be there. Because it's always a representation of the situation. You know, you can't take people with cinema and, you know, in actual sense, place them in Afghanistan. You can only do your best to try and do that. Another very powerful aspect of this film, which really helps elevate this amongst a lot of others, is um, I felt was the score, the scoring and the sound design in particular. Uh, tell us a bit about who uh, who scored it and what was the process in uh, developing the sound design for the film. Yeah. Well, I've worked um, with a Swedish composer called Uno Helmerson uh, for the last three films that I've done. And... Uh, he is a very um, sensitive character that, um, you know, I think he, his music is, is very much, um, he really gets to something that's on the inside of things. Um, it's very emotional, very sensitive, and, and he has a lot of, he has a big spectrum of of storytelling in his music. Was was he doing the sound design as well as the the scoring? No, there's a different sound designer, uh, Rasmus Winter, um, who's a renowned sound designer in Danish film, 
did uh, did a very good job with the sound design and um and I mean music in documentary has always been controversial uh because obviously it is it's it's you pushing something into the film um but again for me it's a question of trying to get closer to things um you can put music that puts you off images and you could put music that pulls you into images and i think for 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 me it was very important that you know that sometimes there has to be a counter story to what you're seeing in the images to point out you know an element of the scene that you want to you want to talk about for instance when the soldiers are celebrating the killing of the five taliban i think you know there's tragedy there because they've lost they've lost their innocence they've lost they've succumbed to the darkness and the brutality of the whole situation and you know they they are relieved they are celebrating they are adrenaline high uh, and that's very much there in the image in the images but i think underscoring that is a fall from grace kind of narrative so i you know my cue to uno in that sense was you know i i want to hear the angels crying over this situation so he came up with this very very beautiful uh these very beautiful strings and strings are often very tacky in film but in but he's able to to actually compose strings that don't sound tacky because they have an edge it certainly sound it was very raw and also often um the the very sort of i want to say warm sounding but at the same time raw sounding strings the cellos in particular juxtaposed next to the often sort of dissonant sound design that that really gave a sense of foreboding or um rawness uh psychologically physically as well to to the film um uh the actual performance was that uh by the the Czech uh, Philharmonic Orchestra mm -hmm. did you go there and supervise that yourself and like what sort of uh, direction were you giving aside from your cues to to Uno um within the um, the composition phase did you have a direct um hand in that as well well i mean when you get to the stage of recordings everything has to be set so you know i i always find that working with a, a composer and i mean uno is the uh you know i love him and we have such a you know challenging working relationship because music is something that's very difficult to talk about actually it's so uh vivid but you know when it's there and you can feel when it's not there uh, and musicians have a language for these kind of things and when you're not a musician you have to try and develop a language with your composer uh, and i mean sometimes the the the, the language of musicians are, are you know falls short of explaining what you're actually trying to to do as well but i mean going to prague doing the recordings you have to have everything set tested you know completely like there's very little room for making alterations in the edit as well um yeah and once it's there it's there you know you can mix things obviously when you get back you can say okay i want the i want the double bass to uh to be dominant in this part i don't want the middle section of the strings to to be you know i hardly want us to hear them because they're flattening the piece or whatever uh, and and you, you you sit in the sound mix in the end and do all these kind of alterations but the dynamics of them playing you know forte or pianissimo or you know you have to have all those details in place was it a full orchestra uh, doing the composition how many musicians were actually involved with this it it was it was it was full strings so it wasn't a full symphonic orchestra which i think is composed of about 60 people the string section is i think around 32 people uh, and so that was the Czech National Symphonic Orchestra and we went to Prague for a day to do the recordings all in one day all in one day they i mean they have developed over the years an expertise in in Prague and in Bratislava particularly they used to do 
so much film scoring because they were cheap and because they have extremely skilled classical musicians that were trained during uh, you know communism and, and all this it was it, it it's really a big thing in Eastern Europe classical music um, as as well as music being uh, certainly one of the key languages of the film emotionally as well and also the editing in particular this with this film the editing has really played a big part in shaping the aesthetics the film the mood the story can you tell us a bit about your relationship with the editor well um Pierre K. Kierkegaard uh, the editor uh, was um, you know is a very also sensitive character he's uh he's a very what you call it a musical character as well uh he's very poetic and he's also he's also an old punk you know he has an attitude and he's not scared of you know you know doing something that's you know out of the box and crazy and we needed that raw energy uh you know, clashing with something that was so, you know, delicate and fine and 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 his temper is very much like that and I think my temper is also very much like that. So we, you know, we really came together in our vision on the film and we were always, you know, a team, me and him, in that process. I mean, ov often, always when you're making film you have heated discussions and clashes with your editor and with your composer and with the cinematographer and and all of that but that at the end of the day him and I I think shared a great understanding of where we were trying to go with this project and um, I mean he's an old timer in Danish editing he's done a lot of very important work uh, previously and um, and I think he added a lot of things to the film in terms of structure and um, you know, apart from the fact that you know he's he he really knows you know what he's doing in terms of you know when to cut in and when to cut out of a scene. Um, he's also very uh, what you call it like you know he he has um, a gut feeling that that really goes. Sorry, that really goes a long way with um, with how you can put anything something together. And when you're working, I mean, the point of working with an editor is very, you know, you're coming home with a lot of experiences from being out there, and then you have to digest that material with an editor. And his fresh sort of perspective on that is extremely important because he is able to experience it for the first time through images. And that's the same experience as a viewer in the end is going to have. So I mean his first reaction to seeing you know dead people being thrown around in the ditch was sadness, immense sadness I think. That this was this was such a you know um feeling of loss. And I know that he he was con he was really strongly considering not doing this film because I uh, he uh, he I think at one point, I don't think he knew whether he could actually deal with this, whether he could deal with the brutality and the darkness of a film like that. Did, did you ever have similar thoughts as you were going, uh, whilst you were making the film? That can you, did you have doubts that you could continue with this and finish it? No, I don't think I ever had doubts whether I could continue and finish it. But I definitely had doubts of how big a price it was going to, you know. You felt this took a, a piece out of your your heart as well, so to speak. Definitely, uh, for sure. I mean, I, I don't think you can go to a war zone without paying a price. And I mean, there's a price to pay for any film, but the price for this film was high because you're playing with, first and foremost, you, you're playing with your life. It's, it's, you're risking your own life to do it. Secondly, you're risking your, you know, uh, mental health in a, in a sense. Um, and... Um, but I mean, coming back to the editing, I also think that this material was so delicate. If you didn't, I think if it wasn't dealt with in the right kind of way, you could have made the worst kind of snuff movie or the worst sort of heroic bullshit portrait of that situation. So I think it was extremely important for Pierre to feel that, you know, 
that my vision and heart was in a place where he trusted that the film would, you know, that he was in good hands, the film was in good hands, that, you know, we were doing something important, even though we had material that you, in most situations you'd say, well, what's the point of showing dead people on a, on a screen? There was a real reason for that. And there was a way of getting to it in terms of the editing that, you know, he trusted, he, you know, or we trusted each other in. And the actual film is about 100 minutes long, but you had over 300 hours worth of footage. So how long an actual process was it to edit this down and go through all of this editing stage? Um, well, we started the editing on the 5th of October, I remember. I'd spent a month before that screening material, and... Um, and then we edited right up until the premiere in Cannes, which was at the end of May. So we edited probably till um, beginning of May or, or late April maybe in order to get the sound design kind of finished for that. I mean, we, you, you, when you're making a film this length, you divide it into reels. And I think there was five reels for the film. So we were still editing on some of the reels while the sound design was being done for, you know, reels that we'd closed off in order to, you know, beef, get the film finished for Cannes. Well, you've certainly, with this film, bridged the, the gap between uh, dramatic narrative and, and documentary. Um, you've been working with some people whom you've known for quite a while and certainly through this experience have developed close working relationships with. What sort of films can we expect from you in the future? Is there anything you're working on right now or is there any type of film you'd like to, to go on to? This was your first feature film. Well, I mean, I've, I've, I did three films in a row like that and I went to war and it's taken me a little bit of time to actually come out of that. Uh, and now Amadillo is touring the whole world and I haven't had many chances to actually sit down and think about new projects. I mean, there are ideas of things that I want to do, and I also actually had a project on the go, but I chose to, you know, step out of that project because I could see that I, I you know, I couldn't live up to the deadlines and the, you know, production role that was happening on that film. Um, so I can't really go into details about where I want to go. I wish I make a romantic comedy but I'm not sure I have it in me. <laughs> Might be good for your mental health by now. <laughs> but do you think it'll be uh, a fiction drama or do you think you want to go back to documentary or wait a bit with that? Mm. Well I'll always be doing documentaries because I have a great heart for documentary but I'm, sh I'm certainly curious about exploring potentials of, of doing some fiction and I think there's, there's limits to what you can do in documentary uh, particularly when you're exploring like the heart of darkness. Darker sides of human nature. Um, so I, I'm not sure where it's really going to go, but I, I know that, you know, I'm going to have to sit down in soon and start writing and thinking. Well, we, we certainly will be very keen to see what, what will come up next. I'm sure you, you've developed an audience globally now, very keen to see what comes from you next. So uh, this is Danish film director Janus metz Peterson from the London Film Festival, where your film has just screened Armadillo and it will be released on for the cinemas here next year. I think, I think in spring next year, yeah. Spring next year. So thank you very much for talking to us and we'll see you soon. Thank you.